Okay, hello everybody. How are you? This is me. And uh, I am happy to talk to you. I really don't know who you are. I don't know who listens to my podcast. I really can't. I don't know at all. But I think probably you are as upset as I am by the demented so-called Supreme Court, which is not actually supreme. It is completely out of it. It is a complete, it, it, it was packed by a criminal who never was the president, except in some technical sense. But from the point of view of his own attitude, he never was. And he appointed, he packed the court, he and, and a gentleman called McConnell packed a court to destroy democracy so they could be dictators, which is what they want to do. And they want a minority rule. That's dictatorship. You know, the ultimate minority rule is dictatorship. And um, so we just have to figure out how to withstand their aggression. It's like the Supreme Court's recent ruling is like invading us as if we're the Ukraine. <laughs> and, and here, my us is 80%. It isn't just so-called liberals or so-called Democrats. It's 80%. 80% don't want to have people shooting up the schools. 80% want good Social Security. They want single-payer socialized medicine, health care like the NHS in England used to be. They want uh, decent ta progressive taxation on the multi-billionaires so they don't pay less tax than someone who makes 50000 etc. Or no tax at all, or, or even tax re re refunds or payments, subsidies from the government like the oil people get. None of us want, 80% of us don't want that. And so... The seeming sort of neck and neck thing has to do with the confusion implemented by the um, the oligarch admirers who want to be them, who admire the ones that are already there, and who again, again the ultimate oligarch is the dictator. That's the ultimate oligarch. Okay. Meanwhile, but before we go into all these politics, and some of you may not like politics, some of you may be my friends. Uh, who like me when I do Dharma teaching. And somehow, strangely, I'm, I'm not really very enlightened, as my wife and children will tell you, although they're getting to like me more as I age. <laughs> but, but I can do Dharma teaching anyway, somewhat, you know. I'm kind of a mouthpiece, you know. And um, so before I do that, I want to teach a little Dharma. And then you got the guys who don't like politics, or ladies who are like, you can leave and, and do some and have, enjoy the sunshine. Now we're back where days are getting shorter and shorter again. But we're starting from a high, long day high, you know, midsummer high, luckily. So let me do a Dharma teaching. The main Dharma teaching that I'm into nowadays, and, but, and I've always been into it, but I've been focused more on sort of getting things ordered and organized. But actually, the reassuring side of Dharma, you know, even, you know, the Buddha said he gave a new meaning to the word Dharma, which, by the way, for you Vedic-oriented, Vedist-oriented scholars and, and yogis and so on, the word Dharma was hardly ever used in the Vedic literature. This is a discovery by the great Patrick Olivelle, who is a wonderful translator of Vedic literature. And in his elder years, he also translated uh, some parts of the Buddha's life story, the Lalitavistala, the most amazing show on earth. But he didn't translate it like that. But that's what it means. Lalita means a game or a play and has the double meaning of a play, like a dramatic play, and playing. And Vistala means magnificent or expansive or vast or so on. It's the name of the Buddha's autobiography, you could call it. So Dharma, so Buddha gave it, Dharma meant before that, 
duty, but even then it wasn't much used, and it was mainly, he said, the 18 times he found it written in the Vedist pre-Buddhist literature uh, was uh, in the context of the royal coronation, when the Brahmin priest would coronate a king. And therefore, it meant the duty of the king, because it comes from the verb dir to hold, and it means holding you in duty, and therefore it can mean law, it can mean custom, duty, it can mean um, rule, regulation, this kind of thing, you know, because it hold, that holds your behavior, it holds your thinking, you know, it could be a doctrine like a, a dogma that you have to be believe in, you have to repeat, you know, you can be indoctrinated with. So dharma can mean those things. But the Buddha added something. He said, no, dharma means reality itself. And what's, what, what's great about the dharma, what I have discovered, this was Buddha's main discovery, by the way, third noble truth, third friendly fun fact, is that uh, reality holds you in freedom from suffering. So if we knew reality, we would be blissful, we would be happy, we would be content. There would be no death, there would be no pain, there would be nothing. In other words, not nothing, there would be nothing bad. Everything would be fine, even you know, some little bit of, of, a, of a complication could would be just... Um, uh, you know, you could be overridden by the basic blissfulness of life. That's what Dharma means. It holds you in freedom, holds you in security from suffering, so that you cannot have pain and suffering where it makes you, or you cannot have pain that makes you suffer. You, pain might be something that would alert you to, well, I shouldn't put my hand over in the fire there. <laughs> but so it could be like a communication, but not suffering. All right? And that is Buddha's great discovery. That is the third noble truth. That is nirvana. That is the point of my book, Wisdom is Bliss. Because Buddha also was quick to acknowledge we do suffer if we're not enlightened to reality. If we're meaning knowing reality. Enlightened doesn't mean you have a light in your head. It means that you know what reality is. And then you discover that it is light. It's a kind of light. It's like a, it's, it's an excellent light that it brooks no shadow, brooks no darkness. So it's a transparent light. You know, it doesn't create shadows because it, it, it's a light that everything has the same light. So it doesn't shine on one from thing to another in that way where one is deprived of it and one has it sort of thing. The transparency, clear light, what we call clear light, prabhasvara, that light is in everything. It is everything. It shapes itself even into hard, solid objects. And we then think that's what they are, is a hard, solid object, because we, we are misknowing. We are not knowing what it really is. Transparency. And we're totally interflowing with it all. And so I want to stress this point, you know, so therefore I said, so misknowing, and it's not just ignorance, it's not just that you don't know, it's you actively wrongly know, you think you know, but you don't, you're deluded, in other words, like uh, people like Kavanaugh, Amy Comey Barrett, Judge Thomas, Alito, they're, they misknow, they're even irrational, they're really wacky. They're imposing some sort of crazy thing on all of us. They're fanatics. And uh, we have to fix that, and we will. We will. Believe me. If you, if you do the right thing with your outrage. But I don't want to pump up outrage right now. First, I want to assure you a bunch of things. There will be no nuclear war by Putin. He will not use the nuclear weapons. He enjoys life a little bit somewhere in the midst of his madness. He's, he's gone a little mad now. He is crazy, and that makes him actually evil. But he's, and he has a good side. He has two nice, beautiful daughters. I'm sure he had a good wife for some time. I think they divorced when he got overpowering. 
he he smiles when he rides a horse or something when he shows off his pectorals <laughs> tosses somebody in a judo workout and uh, so he has a good side and he will not use nuclear weapons if even if he tries the angels will prevent it I promise you there will be no nuclear war one two we will survive the climate catastrophe because we will adapt to it and change it and we will stop it we will stop its worst manifestation we will not allow even a few of the petropaths i call them petroleum psychopaths that means but or sociopaths petroleum sociopaths i call them just simply petropaths they will not succeed in destroying all life on earth even though they're bent on it and they're only bent then it's not it, they don't think that's even irrational to not care which is what they behave like and they don't care. They don't think that's irrational because they think life is pointless, meaningless. It's just a sort of, we're biological robots. We have no soul, they have no future. We become nothing when we die. So they just want to grab and guzzle and consume as much as they can before being nothing or before returning to what they really think they are, which is actually nothing. The robot is just running around, you know. So they want to have a happy robot, temporarily, you know, thinking that guzzling endless steaks and wines and liquors and women and children and whatever, or men if they're women, is just, that's it for the book, that helps, that makes the robot cheer up, and then they die and they're nothing, so then that's that. And there's no consequence. So then them, they think they're rational. And if that was reality, it would be rational. And it's, it's incredibly obvious that it's irrational because nothing is nothing. That's a deep Dharma teaching to know that. Nothing is nothing. It's not a place. You can't go there. You're not there now because this is, we're not in nothing. That bell is not, that sound is not nothing. <laughs> So they're not going to do it. We're going to fix it. Please read Kim Stanley Robinson's wonderful Ministry for the Future, which is a sci-fi novel set, however, on this earth in very realistic circumstances. Only pro it's only called you can only call it sci-fi because because science fiction because a it's fiction and it's gripping, so it's an enjoyable read, although a little a little bit tense. But it's, but it's set in 2040 instead of now. And 2040, all the bad trends that are going on now have gotten much worse in his sci-fi thing. But, but anybody who reads it, and a lot of people who have, and I am promoting it, although I don't know him, I don't get a, I'm not his agent, but I admire him, I love him, I, I deeply, deeply respect what he has achieved there, showing us the way out. And by putting it in 2040, it's even more difficult than it would be now. It's already extremely difficult now because we didn't do it before uh, George Bush's friends stole the presidency in the year 2000 when we were supposed to, when we did elect by popular vote, because we all sense in our bones the distress of Mother Earth. So we did elect by popular vote Al Gore, who might be boring sometimes in his untheatrical deliveries, but not really that much. But I mean, he was he, he a little bit. He wasn't just a party animal sort of thing. And um, he's serious, but he also was the environmental president. He wrote Earth in the Balance. <coughs> mm. Mm. Sorry, a prophetic prediction and a pioneering work in environmental science, which led him later to do the Inconvenient Truth, get an Academy Award, and to continue now in the wonderful Climate Reality Project leadership training campaign that he does, having tra tra translated millions of people to really understand what the climate catastrophe really is, to mobilize hundreds of millions, which we need to be mobilized, to do something about it, which we can still do, but we could have done it so much more easily then, 20 years ago. Because since in the last 20 years, with the theft of the presidency by the oil industry, 
through using, putting up as a front man, the happy-go-lucky, cheerful guy, amusing guy, you know, beer buddy sort of guy, W, w good old W, putting him in there and then him not paying attention and them robbing. And they doubled the amount of carbon in the air put in from 1850 to, to the year 2000. They doubled it in 20 years. I mean, it's really shocking. <laughs> So, but anyway, by putting it, so back to Kim Stanley Robinson and the Ministry for the Future, they do what we should be doing now. We're going to do it in the 20s. We're going to have a Ministry of the Future, and it's going to really accelerate the carbon capture, carbon undoing, transition to renewables and to nuclear clean, clean, relatively clean and, and transitional nuclear, small scale nuclear that we need. You know, to help us and to give us time with not with no coal. Forget coal. Joe Manchin can go dig it up by hand any amount he wants, but coal fin industry will soon be finished, even though now it's accelerating again because of the invasion of Ukraine. But, um, uh, and because of the stubbornness of various bureaucracies in China and India and other places, and in, and in West Virginia <laughs> and in Washington. In fact, so uh, so I'm, what I'm, I'm sorry, I'm digressing, you know, because so I'm in a good mood in spite of being upset and outraged as you are by the recent demented writings of Mr. Thomas, who is the irrational person, somehow managed to get his way into like a position where he really has no business occupying. He really should be resigning shortly to join his wife in robbing the presidency again, if he can, by the way, <laughs> trying to, which we will also will prevent, we'll prevent that. But uh, so, so I'm just trying to assure you that this is all in terms of non-desperation. If you feel outraged of things being going wrong on this planet, you shouldn't do it and, and let it make you despair. And then that's, you know, people who despair, they shoot their grandmother in the face, they go shoot children, they do crazy things. They, they do wrong things, or they kill themselves, which is really wrong. By killing yourself, you're, you're destroying a little bit of heaven, because every human being has capacity for heaven, for themselves and for those who love them and who they love. Absolutely. So killing yourself is a completely mistake. doesn't help at all, because you don't become nothing. Whatever bad situation you feel you're in, it gets worse when you wreck your body. Really, because you, you can't destroy yourself. You're indestructible already. But the quality of how you're being indestructible is very transformable for good or ill. So you really should be working on transforming it towards the good. It's only rational. It's not religion. It's not Buddhism. It's not Christianity. It's not Islam. It's not them, although they all have aspects of it through their reality system, you could call it a belief system. It's really scientific psychology and physics about the nature of life. That's what it is. And a system of being educated to understand the nature of life, which we are able to do. That's all the good news. If we insist on not doing it and misunderstanding and, and imposing our delusion on our existence and on others, we will continue to be only occasionally cheered up and mostly unhappy. Okay, so the first big thing to award yourself, and in our culture particularly, we're due to the authoritarian, militaristic, violence-dominating governments that political science says, even says that's what a government is, is a monopoly over the, an institution that has the monopoly over the use of violence in its territory. But actually, a government is not really violent, it, a good government. It's because people don't want to wreck and destroy. It doesn't have to harm people because it helps them so much. There are very few criminals, very few murderers. People are conditioned to be happy and kind and compassionate and friendly and intelligent. And they're educated to be intelligent. And, uh, and so that's what a good government sees to that, that people internalize the ethic, the human ethic, of do unto others, as you would have them do unto you. Because we are the being, all animals actually have to some extent, 
But in particular, we are the being that can imagine being another being. So we can empathize with others more than other animals do. All moms in every animal kingdom, even egg-laying moms, do. Because they sort of know that the egg came out of their body. The egg, or in a mammal, the egg is in the body. They know that. So they all have an ethic of altruism. All life does. Every cell in your body likes coagulating with the other cells. And that's why you have a body. That's why it can form into a body. A community. The body is a community. <laughs> and when it goes bad, then you, that's called cancer. Some, some piece of that body wants to like wreck the rest of it. Okay, so that's my Dharma lesson. Now within that, I'm going to talk Turkey here. I'm going to talk forcefully. But cheerily. There's a be of good cheer. My dear friend, who I haven't seen for too long because of, of not wanting to travel, Michael, Reverend Michael Beckwith, over there in uh, Los Angeles, who, who gives a great sermon called All Right Already. I mean, he probably was other ones too, but that's the only one I heard. All Right Already. I mean, everything is all right already if you know what it is. And you can know what it is. You must educate yourself to do so. You have to investigate it. Okay? And uh, I forgot what he always says. Michael, Michael Beckwith. Oh, yeah. That, that everything is okay. You know, that's what Jesus had to say, that Buddha had to say that. Muhammad, too. He's not a main guy. And, and Moses and Abraham... Abraham means a compassionate father. Abraham, Rahim, Rahim, Raham, those sounds mean compassion, empathy, because it's a word for the womb in the Semitic languages, I believe. Raham, Rahim, Abraham, you know, Rabbi Hillel, Jesus himself was Jewish, so compassionate. Krishna is compassionate. Vishnu is compassionate. All those goddesses, the female gods, goddess. Female creatrixes, they're compassionate. So everything is going to be okay. It already is okay. So that being, when we are being, oh, he says, be of good cheer. That's why I thought of Michael Beck. He's, he's, and he quotes Jesus as saying, be of good cheer. So you must do that, all of us, okay? We can be outraged in form to show we won't tolerate harmful insanity. But we, but the people with whom we are critiquing or challenging or whatever it is, they can sense when we don't actually hate them. When we, when we are actually in a view that they also can be happy if they stop doing whatever evil thing they're doing. Okay? And so our preventive, critical opposition, forceful, it's forceful, it's not based on hatred. Therefore, there's restraint. Therefore, it's done gently, if possible. It's uh, even if it's done harshly because they're being so harsh. It's, it doesn't overdo by hating them. I'm thinking they need to be destroyed or something. Okay, that's very key. That's of course the key to good uh, police work. You know, law is, is being gentle and being and being a really strong person. Also, is always gentle because they know their strength. They're self-confident. You know, the person who's vicious is weak, and so they don't think they can only get there by completely going nuts. You know? Okay? So, okay, so now we've had our... Now, there's a few things I want to say. Liz Cheney and Benny Thompson, the wonderful, and Adam Schiff, and Kinzinger, and all those really wonderful people, they have shown what the Department of... Justice should be showing in a grand jury setting that Trump, poor Donald Trump, is a criminal. He is guilty of trying to destroy America. He has been an asset of the Russian people, or of the Russian, not the people. They don't want to be, live in a kleptocracy themselves of the Russian oligarchs. He has been their asset in that his buildings have been laundering their money for 20, 30 years, never mind whether he got peed on in Moscow and whatever, Miss, Miss Universe, and Putin's penthouse, and what, that, that, never mind about all that. 
Since the 80s, he's been an asset of them. He also never th really thought he could become president. He never thought so. He just wanted to build up his name because that's the only thing he's able to sell before, you know. So having buildings with his name and then laundering money of oligarchs and, and pretending to be an oligarch himself, whereas he's always been in debt. He's always been, been uh, you know, a bad uh, bill payer, you know, a bad loan person, and bankrupted many times, and a uh, tax cheater. I mean, he's, he's basically kind of a petty gangster. But he was in position to, amongst the kind of nouveau riche bourgeoisie uh, from his father and grandfather. Uh, grandfather had a kind of cat house in Alaska after he escaped and dodging the draft in Germany. And father was a Nazi. And he has been, you know, reading Mein Kampf since he was little. And we have to know all that. And then his behavior has been criminal, okay? And yet the Department of Justice has not moved. The New York AG who has them on taxes, they, oh, we're not moving. Uh, I don't know what the one in Georgia is doing. But, you know, he, he, the, 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 the select committee has done the job. And there's no question he will be convicted, he will be imprisoned, and he must be. Because his big lie, where, which, you know, and the, you know what the big lie is, you have to know, big lie doesn't mean it's a big lie, it's a technical term. It was devised for Hitler. And what it means in particular within the advertising industry and the sort of influencing industry is you tell people that your opponent is doing what you are actually doing in full sight of everybody. You're doing it. And then you say the other one is doing it. So it's a kind of, it's so preposterous, in other words, the lie, that people believe it because they think, well, that's too preposterous if you just to make it up. If you try, if he's lying, he would try to be clever and say something that was more plausible. But he's being completely implausible, you know, like, like you know, like Hillary Clinton is a cannibal or something. You know, like, so Wellesley graduate, do-gooder, Girl Scout, professional politi political Girl Scout is a cannibal. You know, I mean, that that's called a big lie. Okay, so he's been trying to rob the country. He robbed, the, trying to rob the presidency. He originally robbed the presidency the first time, in fact. And then he says other people are doing it. That's the cult of big lie. That's why they call it that. Right? That's why we call it that. So, I mean, this is known, and they've shown it. Now, here's, this is one of the main points I wanted to make today. He, as a criminal, he appointed, with the collusion of Mitch McConnell, who himself is a crony of Oleg Deripaska, who is a Russian oligarch who McConnell got off the sanctions list since 2014 and pretended to build some aluminum plant in Kentucky to aggrandize himself with McConnell to help him get votes in Kentucky. And they never followed through with it, though, because once he was off the list, he just went on with his oligarchic behavior, dear Oleg. <laughs> I don't dislike oligarchs, by the way. They're also clever. They've done their best. They've got those billions. Eventually, sooner or later, if it keeps up, they end up giving it away because they get old and they eventually finally realize they're going to die. And then they decide they want to do something good and then they start giving it away. And then they can do great things. I don't, I don't hate them. I don't hate any billionaires. I, like, I love them. They're wonderful. They get, they're, they're pursuing a little bit delusive thing after the first billion, <laughs> because every subsequent one, even the, after the first hundred or the first tens of millions, because once you get that lot of money, then you just have to hire a lot of people. You worry about them cheating you or you're losing it, and it becomes a big stress. It doesn't really make you happy at all. It makes you really, it, because it's a huge responsibility that weighs upon you. Anyway, um, so, so anyway, back to Trump. So they've shown that he's, he is uh, convictable. And if somebody's not going to be above the law, and if we're going to honor our being a country of rule of laws and not of people, and then no one is above the law, he must be judged and convicted. And the reason people don't is that they're thinking, well, he's an ex-president. 
And it's embarrassing for the great democracy to have to admit that a president was a criminal. Nixon sort of spared us of all that because he resigned quickly. He was also a criminal, but he resigned quickly and then uh, and on the deal with Ford to pardon him, and then they pardoned him. So it's not embarrassing. It proves that we are truly a democracy, that, that, that someone can be a president and be an, an evildoer, or in a sense, a, a wrongdoer, let's call it. Definitely. And, he, and, and I want to make this one point. This is my Eureka point announcement, one of my Eureka announcements of today. Trump never was the president of our United States. Never. Because it's not only that you have to have the numbers that some people have voted for him, and many people did, and they were all kind of Russian bots and Cambridge Analytica and all kinds of crim and Facebook behave bad behavior and did all kinds of terrible things. But so he somehow, to his own surprise, he did emerge as the victor over someone who'd been training and preparing to be a good president and the first woman president, the first national mom, like an Angela Merkel of America in history, which we really need. And uh, so we were deprived of that. And uh, But the point is, it's not only that you get those numbers and, and you know, and then you, that, that makes you sort of technically president. There's also a subjective aspect of being president. You have to decide you are president. To be president means you have to know what the job is. To know what the job is, you have to be there. You realize you're the servant of the people. And you have to put your own interests and your own desires and your own selfishness aside. I mean, you can preen a little bit and act like I'm a great president, but you have to serve people. That's what the job is. And he never planned to do that. He didn't even have, as Obama said in the Democratic nomination thing now in 2020, he said he didn't grow into the job. But the point is, he didn't know he had a job. That's my point. So he, he just moved his business into a house that wasn't as well appointed as his triplex in the Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue in New York. It was it had more dingy, dowdy curtains, <laughs> more dingy carpets, more dingy plumbing, no gold plumbing fixtures and so forth. So he just moved into the house and, uh, you know, he had a big fancy hotel that he bought nearby so he could go over there and have a drink and make money with. He was just making money. That's all he was doing. He was not serving as the president. That's why he could have managed the, 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 the epidemic, why he was trying to wreck the European Union to please the Russian oligarchs, starting with Putin. And he was trying to not support Ukraine to please them so they could grab it. He, you know, they, so they kicked that. He, he lauded them kicking England out, England kicking itself out of the greatest organization on the planet since World War II, founded to prevent world wars, which started in Europe and which often happened in Europe, but didn't happen for 80 years or whatever. Uh, because of the European Union and the foolish British pulled out without having an empire to pull out into. <laughs> he applauded that. So he did everything wrong, in other words. Totally. Totally. Because he wasn't being servant of us. He was not our president from his own perspective. He was just a petty gangster, as Bob De Niro calls him, who didn't even have a code of honor as a gangster because he would turn on anybody like he was going to hang Pence when Pence wouldn't join him in his criminality. And so it's not an embarrassment to put him away. In fact, it's embarrassment if we don't. Mr. Merrick Garland, I, this is a open podcast for you. I hope somebody plays it for you. It's not an embarrassment. It's a duty. He has to be prosecuted, judged, and most likely convicted. And this thing about we don't know about his intent, we do because he always says what his intent is. He tells us his intent. Take him at his word. I'm, I, I'm going to be president again. I'm going to take. I'm going to not count the votes. I'm going to my vice president. Not going to count. He's one, one way after another. Hundred to two hundred and fifty million. He's cheated people out of, in order to insist that he deserves and should have the presidency. He should get back into the White House, again, not to be president. President means you're serving the people. You're not just serving yourself. 
and that he's not capable of that himself. Absolutely not. You really get honest testimony from his wife, past wife, surely, and present one, definitely. Just look at their posture when they dance. <laughs> Just. So, so that's the first point. It's not an embarrassment. He never was president from his own side. I'm not denying he was elected. And even though many people voted, but 7 million less than voted for Biden. And only because of Fox News. Fox News, the second main point of Fox News should be illegal. Not the news part, but the opinion part. They are spouting Russian propaganda every day. And there are gullible people who, who are miseducated and who misknow intensely, who are wrongly convinced of all kinds of crazy, even to their own death. People shouting and screaming in a hospital when they're dying of COVID-19 that there is no such thing as COVID-19, they've been told. Because that's what they heard on Fox News. Don't get fact by, by, by opinion people who themselves are vaccinated, telling them not to vaccinate, which should be criminal. It, Reagan, you know, ruined it. This is all really started by Reagan in 1981. My, my hero, second person I want to recommend and promote is Heather Cox Richardson. You can read her free postings on substack.com. And she is giving us all big American history lessons two or three times a week, if not sometimes every day. She's a professor of American history somewhere. And she is tremendous. And she really gives you, really straightens us out about what is going on and what reality is about the thing, you know, really, as a historian. And for example, the filibuster, why does anybody take it seriously for a minute? Some pompous thing with your mansion, well, it enables us to have a good dialogue in the Senate. It's a complete nonsense. You know, if you know, which I didn't know until I read from Heather Cox, I didn't know this. It was started by slave owners in the 1830s who were in a minority, and they realized that the, the tide on planet Earth, the ethical tide on planet Earth was against human slavery. In England, uh, earlier than the U.S., and so they wanted to rule as a minority, the government. So they infiltrated the institutions of government. And then they cooked up this thing called the filibuster, pretending like, oh, we have to worry about the minority. Whereas the founding fathers were into how majority rule is democracy. And they never were so worried about minorities. In fact, they were disliking party systems because they were thought party people were becoming more loyal to the party than to the nation was dangerous to the nation, as we see it is now, the way the Republicans are playing it. In the past, it was the Democrats uh, who were the slave owners, and it was the Republicans who liberated them, and Lincoln. And, uh, and that was a terrible, destructive war, how many people were killed. And these people, the same kind of thing is happening now. And we, have to, we should have knowledge of what happened in the past, so therefore filibuster is no. And it is no... The minority people, when they're a, 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 the slimmest majority, they can cancel the filibuster right away. That's how they packed the court with three religious fanatics, Catholics, by the way, to who, and by the way, I agree. As a Buddhist, I agree that a fetus has a human soul. I do agree with that. All Buddhists do. Dalai Lama does. But then they say, we don't legislate that, however, on top of people who don't believe that. We can't, because that's enforcing our spiritual beliefs. We don't have such a convincing, we can't prove it. You know, and well, we can in a way, but not in a way that they would accept. So it is a sad thing, of course, abortion, absolutely. And the miracle of giving birth and conceiving and gestating and creating a beautiful thing that all women can do is, a, is miraculous, and they should be so deeply honored for that. But, you know, this legislating of what to do for them, even if they're raped or they're sick or they're or it's economically destructive to their lives or whatever it may be, this is completely wrong. It's not democracy. It's not the founding fathers. It is not. It's not original. Originalism is a fake thing. 
for some minority ruling people who want to move. Don't forget, originalism goes back to a time when a tiny minority were the only people who voted. White male landowners. No women, no, no Indians, no blacks, no immigrants who didn't own property. Just a small number of property owners, white males. So if originalism, if we do that, we're back to the frontier. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, there's that, and, there, and we white men are too stupid. And we're too, like, uh, there's too much tech that would, that would magnify our bad tempers, our ill tempers. Because the women would be not nice to us because we'd be so domineering. And therefore we'd be unhappy and irritable and destructive. So that originalism is a way of destroying all joy in life. Where are the most miserable places on planet Earth where women are chattel? Saudi Arabia, which is not Islam. Muhammad was not into that. Muhammad loved women. He honored them. He took care of them. He changed all rules of divorce and property and blah, blah. And, and Saudi Arabia is just coming up with some of their own like male chauvinist ridiculous thing and projecting it into Islam. It's not part of Islam. No way. Sultans with harems may have distorted some aspects of Islam Judi jurisprudence in the thousands of 1400 years since Muhammad's time. But in Muhammad's dispensation, his vision, his transmission of God's uh, good energy, there's no anti-women thing in there. Very pro-women, relative, relative to the times. So, so, but and this is this is another made newsflash. You, if you research it, you look up the name of Richard Vigory, V I G U E R I E. He was a big right wing fundraiser. He was a pal of Jerry Falwell, and the sort of moral majority in the late nineties of trying to bring the religious people into into political power. You know the idea, and then the idea of dominionism overcoming the old thing of separation of church and state that has given America its great spirituality, that's given us our democracy, not allowing the kind of, you know, religious, nationalistic, religious, militaristic, nationalistic religion, government being an arm of the religion. Not allowing that is what is all our creativity came from there. All America's fortune came from there. The people who asked Jefferson to be sure of that were the Baptists, actually the evangelicals, because they were a minority then against the Puritans, sort of more mainstream Protestants. And therefore, they didn't want to be persecuted by the Puritans, by the Congregationalists and the Methodists and these kind of people. So they demanded that. And now they are the ones who are doing dominionism, where they want onboard Christian soldiers, they want to wield nuclear weapons in Christ's name. And Jesus weeps. He weeps when he thinks about them wanting to use his backing to legitimize violence. So anyway, therefore, before this happened, when Roe v. Wade was first passed, pastors, Baptist ones included, were happy about it. They did not protest it. Maybe the Catholic Church did because their the Catholic Church, you have to realize, outside of America, is in a demographic competition with Islam in Africa and South, especially in Africa and with Asian religions in Asia. So if anybody gets to be Catholic, they want more children out of them. So that's their nutty thing about even contraception. Do you know, like any male in their life, they have a million, million sperms. So any male could have a million kids if they didn't have to, like, bear them in their womb. So the idea that you can't use contraception, that that's somehow taken off, that is ridiculous. But they do that because they're, they want more members. Because they're into market share as a corporation. And those three people who, who unbalanced the court, packed in there by Trump and McConnell, in the most ridiculous filibuster nuclear option manner, you know, using the ability to cancel the filibuster when they felt like it. When they were not a big enough majority to pack the court, they put these lunatics in there who are nice people in their own way, you know, but they are sort of burn you at the stake type of people. They have the light in their eye, glint in their eye. They, 
they think Jesus gives them right, rightness, righteousness to put anybody away for whatever reason. So look out. And uh, that's really, you know, it was Christians who burned all the wise women in Europe for centuries. I want you to know. Because they didn't listen to Jesus. Jesus never said, burn some women who know about herbal medicine, who know the cure for the common cold. <laughs> echinacea. Never. And yet, how did they, the Inquisition, and then unbelievable what they did. So, this is a, you know, any, even Buddhists can be really bad too by being fanatical. Religious fanaticism is totally no good no matter who is doing it. And in a way, the pseudo-religion of communism and Marxism is totally no good also. And the pseudo-religion of different conspiracy theories is no good. Science, we need reason. We need to understand. When we understand the world, we'll be happy in the world. We'll be able to help create happiness with others in the world, when we understand them and it. That's really key. So, so then, now we come to the outrage of the... So the reason that the pastors didn't mind abortion, however, initially, with Roe v. Wade, and everybody would like that, is that there are many instances where women become pregnant when they really don't want to be pregnant. And no one has a right to force them to do so. They are not breed cows. They're human beings. And in addition to being women. And they uh, are getting abortions anyway when, that's, when their circumstances are such. And they were doing that. And the, and the pastors knew that because the pastors kind of psychiatrists for their parishioners or good ones are. So they were happy they could have a healthy, not harmful, not coat hanger and weird chemicals or strange strange, uh, you know, damaging, physically damaging actions. For example, someone who wants to have many kids might want to have an abortion at, at, at 18 or 16 when they're not ready for that. So they don't want to damage the equipment so they can have kids when they have a good relationship in their late to mid-20s, right? So those pastors were happy that they had medical help. But this Richard Vigory knew this could become a good wedge issues, what they call in politics, wedge issue, which means it can be made into an emotional issue where people think they're really helping life. They're doing saintly things. They're dealing with satanic evildoers, so they'll get all, they'll go, become outraged. And they'll be then victimizable because they will take, vote for people like Reagan, like the Bushes, like Trump who actually, obviously, if you look with common sense, with common coolie, they're going to harm you because they only like rich people. They want to take away your Social Security. They want to take away your health care. They want to take away your good school. They want to take away everything and get all the money for themselves. Use the government to make themselves into oligarchs. That's what the once Lincoln's party, the Republican Party, that was party of liberation, became, since the 60s, especially, after Eisenhower, but, and particularly in its times of power since Reagan, it became the party of the minority super-rich. And therefore, in order to deceive the poor or the middle class and to take their money away from them to be more rich, they had to have wedge issues. And these are like cultural issues. Oh, gay people are really bad. People of other races are really bad. It's the black people who are on welfare who are ruining you and why you can't get a job and why you feel so poor. It's not the, your rich boss who takes away your union membership, who exports your job to China where he can have slaves by upholding a dictatorship that enslaves its own people under communism. This is how you've been deceived, and even the and then even the, you know the, you know the, it's just the whole thing is <laughs> tax cut Santa Claus, overwhelming social system Santa Claus, welfare Santa Claus. That's what's happened in the last forty years. And uh, I, I mentioned I mentioned Heather Cobb Richardson because she says the time when America was really expanding people's rights. 
economic, civil, cultural, was this can be counted by a historian from 1933 to 1981. And in 1981, cumulatively, working on it since, since Goldwater and Nixon and so on, the party of the rich, of the over-rich, rather, party of the over-rich became more and more adept at their tax cut Santa Claus and overwhelmed the FDR and following social system Santa Claus and deceived the people to that, that, that government was their enemy and so progressively paralyzed the government until it reached the time in 2016 when it was so paralyzed that a completely unfit person could conceivably be numerically through the electoral college, at least, if not popularly, be the president. And actually, W. Bush was also completely unfit. His own father knew that. He was playboy. He was not. Cheney knew that, therefore he manipulated him. Cheney was a, the old Cheney was a petropath. The young Cheney is, has become a democratic, wonderful conservative hero. We need conservatives. They need to be honest ones who will be a loyal opposition when they are in the minority. And when in the majority, they will truly govern for the benefit of the people. They will serve the people, which is what a democratic government should be doing. Okay? So, but don't worry. You, you, my last message for today, channel your outrage. Protest and go in the street, that's good. But in a way, long run, that's not going to change their behavior. What you have to do is you have to channel it into $10 for every Democratic candidate in every close race or every race, in the Senate especially, and in the House as well. Don't listen to the media who get paid advertisements by the oligarchs and the petropaths by saying that, oh, it's inevitable the first midterm election of a new president is always against his party. That could that has been the case because of the destruction by Reagan of the Fairness Doctrine, which allowed propaganda to infest our cable media and allowed Murdoch to infest your brain. So many of you, 100 million, you know, 60 million of you. Otherwise, the crazies in this country are always around 18 to 20 percent. That's why they couldn't win elections. But when another 25 percent sort of independent, think of themselves as independent, but get casual, they, don't, they, they get swept up in that craziness. And then another 15, 20 percent of the majority don't bother to vote because they're complacent or they get desperate or they get defeatist. Then we can get these terrible oligarchic, presidents and, and officials and senators and congresspeople who use the government to oppress us rather than use the government to defend us, which is their job. They take an oath of office and then they ignore that I, to uphold the faith and good credit of the Constitution of the United States. That's what they take that. I don't take it to rob the presidency to 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 invest in things that I make bills about and then I get a raise of investment. Those people are crooks. They're not public servants. So channel the outrage into organizing. You leftists join with you moderates on the, on the so-called left, which are the right ones now. And don't fight between yourselves for the next six months. We have to defeat that sort of rule of thumb, which is part of our corrupt politics that somehow we automatically lose. That all that all That's a method of strangling the government so it can't defend us against corporations and the oligarchs. You know, the president should have a time. Obama only had two years and he was paralyzed by Gingrich and McConnell. Or McConnell. Clinton was paralyzed by Gingrich. And that's part of the that's part of the destroy the government that started by Reagan. The government is the problem. It's not that the government can help you solve your problems. It's that the government is the problem. That's a very bad destroying 
That's a big lie that destroys democracy. The definition of fascism by Mussolini is when the government and the big corporations and the oligarchs are all working together to suppress the people whose institution is just their family and their job or jobs in a bad economy. Everybody has to work. And the family is not strong enough to resist corporations and governments. Definitely not. If they're unified. But a good government, democratic government, defends against people, the robber barons when they get too strong. That's the whole point of democracy. So channel your outrage into the vote that's coming up and organizing for the vote and getting on the media and speaking up in coffee shops and telling someone who's blurting and blabbing QAnon that they're, they're wrong. Bravely telling them. You know, don't get angry with them. Tell them in a nice way, but tell them. Speak up and vote. And then vote with, with your pocketbook with $10 here and $3 and $27 there. If you're not, even if you're not wealthy, try to give. And then when you give your $3, think a million people are giving, so that's three million. I'm now one of a million. If you can give 30, that's 30 million. That, you know, the oligarchs are actually stingy. They don't give that much, you know, campaign contribution to their people, to their puppets, you know. They don't. They're very stingy. They don't want to pay. They want this all, the, this hoard all the money because it's like a disease. It's an obsession. Stinginess is a, is a disease, disease. So channel this outrage. And then we get, we don't have to get 60 senators. We just need a majority in the House, and we just need enough senators to overwhelm three or four, two no well-known ones, Cinema and Mansion, and maybe a few more. So we need four or five, we need 55 seats. That's enough in the Senate. Then we can cancel the filibuster when we need to. Then with the canceled filibuster, let them shout and scream, much as they like, you pass a law that is Roe v. Wade, freedom from forced pregnancies, legal abortion, medically legal, and criminal punishment for fanatic pro-life fanatics who are going to shoot doctors, harass people on their way to the clinic, and so on, and really put them back into, they can still espouse their theory and their view and make, they you don't know, free speak freely, but they can't physically assault and attack and, and state legislatures cannot pass ridiculous two-week laws or any kind of, or even your raped no law, or any, you can't even leave your state. You're imprisoned in your state. They can't pass that. That's just passed out as a law. Let's see the Supreme Court go and say that law is wrong. We'll see. Second, play, because they have this ridiculous majority where even, even Roberts didn't vote for this asinine bill they just did, and Roberts has no control over the complete fanatics. Alito, Thomas, Thomas just does it out of malice. He's not a Catholic. He just does it out of pure malice. He's so irritable and malicious, that guy. Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Barrett, and they, that gives them five, and there's one other crazy one, I forgot his name, but it's not Thomas. I mean, it's not, it's not Roberts. And then we put up three more. Just make the Supreme Court membership uh, uh, 13 instead of 13 monkeys instead of nine. Make it 13 and, and pass that bill and then put all and then pass the filibuster to put them through and make them all sensible per, and then make a test for those four. They don't have to all be Democrats. Some could be Republicans. The test would be a test of rationality. For example, before this crazy thing, they passed Citizens United bill about use of money in politics. And that's completely irrational. And they said that corporations can make as money donations as they want to their political candidates of choice because money is free speech. Because money is speech. And it's free speech. So you can give. So that's ridiculous because it's irrational because and they never actually had a rational argument about it. They just decreed it, actually. It's a long-standing decree of very right-wing judges since the 19th century. And in that decree, they pretend, the point is when you form a corporation, 
you you shield your personal assets as a free speech person speaking in order to take entrepreneurial risk as a group to do something creative. So therefore, your own donations as a person, that's your free speech maybe, an individual. But the corporation can't not say it's a person because the persons there are only partially present in that corporation because they are shielding their personal assets from risk against, uh, you know, if the corporation does something that, that uh, somebody sues the corporation, they are some, they're somewhat shielded. So therefore, corporation is not an individual person. Therefore, it can't be treated like one. Therefore, it cannot use huge money, which can outbid any individual, to bribe congressmen and senators, or even presidents. They can't. And then the government itself should give $100 million or $10 million to campaigners. The media should be forced, as a condition of getting the airwaves that the government dishes out to them, to give free time in equal measure to different candidates. Another of the things that brought Trump out of the woods, out of obscurity to get the president, was that NBC and ABC got so many eyeballs by turning up outrage by all his ridiculous shenanigans that they gave him billions of dollars worth of free airspace, for example, it was, which they could, know, they could only do because of the corrupt government having been so corrupted since Reagan's time. Understand. So then we so we fix the court, and then if they don't have enough rooms in the courthouse building, we build an extra room, some extra rooms for the other thirteen. <laughs> maybe we make them have term limits. It's maybe sixteen years or eight years or seventy years of age. They have to retire. Maybe or seventy-five. They have to retire some kind of term limit. And you just pass a law like that. And then you pass a law that there cannot be a opinion expressed on television or radio without a counter opinion, a fact checker, right in the expression, right in front of the expression. So that if someone just talks lies, tells lies, someone is there to say, that's a lie. Not some fact checker six weeks later that the brainwashed person will not have a chance to have the benefit of. So, you know, we just get back to Congress to be a working Congress, and they start passing laws, and we start fixing things up. It's very easy. And then, and then we stop subsidizing the oil industry. And we put all that subsidy, 20, 30 billion a year, we put it into renewables and nukes, by the way. Nuclear reactor generating electricity, not big, ugly ones that mess up the climate like Three Mile Island and they're dangerous and have all this polluted water and radium. There's a new kind of thorium nuke. There's some studies and books, even the best environmentalists know about it. I know this is heresy for Greenpeace and people, but it's a necessary bridge to keep all the lights on, to charge up the electric vehicles and electric trucks and electric heaters. We need nukes because of their level of population. And we need to, and, and it will revive old shipbuilding industries. The good new ones can be built like a, on a ship hull assembly line, much cheaper. And they can be put up and they can be put away from out of pollution air level very easily. It's very doable. Please study up on it. Anyway, I know there's a lot of shocking things, starting with <laughs> the big news flash. Nothing is nothing. Trump was never president. We will, the ultimate reality is the clear light of infinite energy, of pure transparency, brilliant, loving light, divine love and compassion. God is love. Love is God, just as much, you know, and goddess. Love is Mr. and Mrs. God, even. Okay? So everything is good. That's, that, so no nothing. God is love. Love is God. Love is Buddha. Buddha is love. Love is Krishna. Krishna is love. Goddess is love. Love is goddess. Okay, that's the second one. Third one, the president, the, the so-called ex-president, Mr. Trump, was never president from his own side, so it's not embarrassing that he should be judged and his lies should be refuted rationally and rationality becomes an important matter 
we have to go back to Madison's concept of deliberative democracy. We can pass gun laws that are reasonable. Just make the gun producers liable by lawsuit for somebody shooting everybody. They're going to make. They're going to stop making machine guns for the general population. They're going to stop. And there'll be a lot of machine guns that'll be there saved in case we anybody invades. You know, keep it in the armory, okay, somewhere, because they'll all give them back. Keep their hunting rifles and their whatever they need for their defense. And uh, they would, nobody needs an assault rifle. This is just bam. It can be passed in one season of of a of a Congress, even before Biden retires. Don't worry about Biden. He's not going to run again. He doesn't feel like it. He's well. He should get the. He should be honored for the wonderful things he's done, jolting Joe Biden, and he won't run again. And I think we get a woman. I don't know if it's going to be Kamala, but she would be great. But it'll be someone. We need a mom, I think, to preside over a little bit disarmament and and gentleness in our to model it to the people. And uh, this was a shocking thing. Three. Irrationality. No one who is irrational cannot pass a basic reasoning exam should be allowed to be a Supreme Court judge. We can add four Supreme Court judges to rebalance the court. Uh, very quickly, pass a gun law very quickly, pass Roe v. Wade as a legislation very quickly, and um, it's all boom, boom, boom. So it's just that quick. This whole thing, you know, Obama's famous statement of yes, we can, will actually prevail, finally. <laughs> not the no we can't that he started saying once he was in the White House. Yes, we can. And maybe we'll get a good, you know, a good president who'll be a comedian. Chris Rock, oh no, but a female comedian, one of those great female comedians. We need a comedian president like they, the, the lucky Ukrainians have Volodymyr Zelensky, not some self-important pompous guy, a comedian. A, wo a woman comedian would be the ideal president, Okay. Maybe multiracial woman comedian. All right, so that's it. Goodbye. Thank you. This is my outrage channeling. Vote, register, help others register, give donations, even if three dollars. You can sprinkle it here and there. Remember, if hundreds of millions sprinkle it, it's hundred, it's three hundred million dollars. That will wear out the oligarchs with all their campaign contributions. It get TV time. Later, we will change the TV time and be free, but it's not the case now, so you give some money. Right now, register, vote, really turn out. 60, 70 percent of the people turn out, and there'll be, we will keep Congress, and we will keep the 80 percent who wanted assault rifles banned, the 80 percent who didn't want uh, abortion banned, the 80 percent who want sane people in the government, and they want good entertainment on the TV and not propaganda and brainwashing. That's 80%. Don't worry. It's Republicans and Democrats, where they're not confused by all this thick mess that has been made by starting with, I'm sorry to say, Mr. Reagan. Okay? All right? So thank you. Be of good cheer. We dedicate the merit of this uh, short conversation to... All of you becoming as enlightened as you are capable of being, which is very enlightened, every single one of you, which is reasonable. It doesn't mean in a blinding flash you become a fanatic. It means you become very reasonable, very compassionate, very empathetic, very loving, very happy, very friendly, very cheery, as quickly as possible. I don't mean to domineer you. I don't want anybody else doing it. I don't want any religious people doing it. I don't want any political people doing it. I don't want any fanatical people doing it. You are your own boss and master. You have your own reason. You are your own lover. You can love everybody, including yourself, and, you being ha and you'll be happy when you do it. Okay? So all the best. Take it easy. And by one thing, but not only the Ukrainians, but we should all resolve, when we get our own government back under control, to liberate the Russian people and the Chinese people. And liberating them means also liberating their oligarchs and their dictatorship of the proletariat, stupid Marxist idea that the Chinese have. Where dictatorship is not of the people, it's just of the dictator is the problem. You know? And they all need to be 
released where each one has a little jewel of freedom, reason, compassion, and good cheer, such as what democracy, the ideal of democracy, can be realized. There's nothing stopping anybody from realizing it, except bad habits and a sense of defeatism, which we were going to get rid of, right? By knowing that reality has the energy we need not to be defeated, okay? All the best. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, my engineer.